speaker is Dr. Ahmed Al Misiri, Prof of Psychiatry, Ain Shams University, Regional Representative of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, UK. Uh, he's going to talk about long-acting injectable antipsychotics, reality and myth. Welcome, Dr. Misiri. <coughs> it's really a pleasure to be with you. It's really a pleasure to be in, uh, in Jeddah, um, a country that uh, uh, has got a lot of significance to me. Uh, I really welcome uh, uh, my the invitation to speak to you today, and uh, I'm really pleasure to be with you. Uh, today we're going to uh, explore some uh, uh, myths and some realities about long-acting injections. The reason behind this presentation that there has been a surge in the prescription of long-acting injections in the UK that caused considerable budget constraints on the NHS. And therefore, okay, we, had, we, we wanted to critically look on what the companies are telling us okay, and what actually long-acting injections can do. Uh, long-acting injections are licensed for the treatment of schizophrenia. And this is the first reality we're going to talk of. Schizophrenia. There is about 24 million patients suffering from schizophrenia in this world. In an, uh, a study that we did and published in 2011 about the epidemiology of schizophrenia was a meta-analysis. We found that the mean uh, 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 point prevalence of schizophrenia is 0.34 percentage, okay, which is a huge number. One, uh, seven in every 100,000 people suffer from schizophrenia each year. This is considerable. The amount of loss and the amount of disability schizophrenia causes is horrendous in terms of disability adjusted for five years or years lived in disability. Because schizophrenia comes the third among the neuropsychiatric disorders in respect to years lived with, lived with disability. So it's a disabling illness. It's not only a disabling illness, but has got a special course, okay, or a course that deemed to uh, uh, unfavorable outcomes in general. Okay. We know that people start with pre-morbidly with schizophrenia. They, have, they can function. When they start with podroma, their function decreases. And then with the first episode, their function drops markedly. With the relapsing of the illness, their function drops markedly. And then they become chronic. And we have a picture like what Emil Kraplan suggested in 1919 about the dementia precox. With all this course and with these relapses, what we have is increasing neurodegeneration, you know, with the pruning, increase in the pruning of uh, certain rights and, and decreasing the cortical uh, cells. Treat, uh, people become more treatment resistant, okay, and this ability increases. So this is a reality about the illness we are treating. What is the myth? The myth is that we have got favorable course or an outcome of schizophrenia. This is a similar paper by Martin Shepard and David Well. Watts. Uh, this is an old paper, but it tells you something about the course of schizophrenia. Analysis of most of the results were talking about outcome and clinical outcomes since 1900, okay, till uh, 83. And what you can see even is nearly a decade, a nearly a, a century. So, the same problem with poor clinical outcome. We may have had better social recovery nowadays, but still we face poor clinical outcome with schizophrenia. That's why when we talk about the treatment of schizophrenia, we see the glass only half full. Why? As you see from this graph, there's only 10% that in green of people with schizophrenia have got uh, or achieve monophasic remission. That means one remission. In total, people who achieve remission are 22% only from patients with schizophrenia. That is appalling. When we look on the course of schizophrenia, 
at any time, okay, comparing both the, those with uh, uh, presented with schizophrenia uh, and those with first episode psychosis. We found that response varies from 18 to 65 percent. Okay, then remission is decreased actually to about 7 to 50 percent. Those who relapse from remission rates are higher up to up to 60 percent. Those who become chronic at the end are 10 percent. So the course of schizophrenia needs some sort of readjustment. We need to look onto how we can modulate this course. Why the outcome is is poor in schizophrenia? We actually don't know. Is this a problem in data? Because most of the studies uh, uh, are uh, short-term studies. There are very little long-term studies about outcome. There are, but they are very sc scanty in literature. Are we measuring outcome wrongly? Because a lot of studies use a lot of measures to uh, define outcome. So we don't have consistency about outcome, whether it's the quality of life, which is social functioning, what sort of social functioning is, is it? Okay. Is the, have we got a problem in the course? We know from early that you know one third of the patients or uh, one third of the patients are deemed to chronic course. So is it the course of the illness? Are there illness variables like uh, 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 duration of untreated uh, uh, psychosis, uh, the presence of uh, neurological uh, uh, soft signs? Are all these things that out affect the outcome, or is it the treatment? Are we treating them late? Are we treating them inappropriately? So we don't know why we don't have outcome. Added to this are the patient's variable. The most uh, problematic of these patient's variables are compliance, okay? So can we change the course of illness or modify the course of illness by, uh, by modulation, uh, uh, by using uh, uh, medication? We know that uh, uh, poor compliance is the main, uh, uh, our most powerful predictor factors for relapse. And we know relapse is re uh, related to poor outcome. We know even small gaps of, in medication, like even one to two days, can cause significant increase in relapse rates. So are we able to modulate the course by modulating compliance? We don't know. The limits, all guidelines, prescri uh, prescri uh, all guidelines uh, uh, prescribing guidelines advocate the use of long-term medication, one to two years, up to five years. This is mission impossible. Will you know that 70% of people with schizophrenia are non-compliant? We published a paper last year um, uh, in schizophrenia research about uh, uh, poor compliance in schizophrenia and we found that nearly 70% of patients are not compliant. The CATI studies found the same result, about 74%. And we clinicians are not good in actually finding the poor compliance in our patient. So compliance is a major problem. So there has been recently a search of, uh, 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 or a lot of pharmaceutical companies trying to advocate shots for recovery and trying to use long-acting injectables. We did an audit in 2014, 2013-2014, about prescribing of long-acting injectables in United Kingdom, where I work. And we found that our prescription for long-acting injections increased from 110,000 sterling pounds to 1.2 million in one and a half years. Huge amount. Okay, so is this, are we on the right track? Are we investing uh, this huge amount of money in, in, uh, rightly or wrongly? Let's go. The, the main tradition, or the tradition of uh, 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 prescribing antipsychotics that we use to use long-acting injectables for patients who are more severe, poorest compliance, poor insight, high number of hospitalization, all those people with poor outcomes. Okay, but this 
paradigm is changing. We have been, rightly or wrongly, we don't know, trying to advocate the use of long-acting injectables early in the course of schizophrenia rather than later. Try to, we are trying to use it in people with better outcomes. Perhaps we can improve these outcomes. There has been a change in attitude. This is a, a survey of psychi uh, on psychiatrists in 2003 about the use of antipsychotic long actable, uh, long acting injectables. And as you see, they, they think it's old fashioned, this thing is stigmatizing, less acceptable to patients, less acceptable to the family. Funny enough, 10 years later, okay, psychiatrists say that long acting injectable health relapse, 93% of psychiatrists agree to that. Long acting injection enhanced compliance. 80% of psychiatrists believe in that. 91% uh, uh, believe that it's better than oral, injection, uh, oral uh, medication. So our attitude is changing. Why, why people started to argue about this changing paradigm? They say that medic, um, uh, Long-acting injectables improve adherence. They decrease relapse. They are more effective in terms of outcomes. They are better on cognitive functions. They have good impact on gray matter, okay, especially with pruning theory and the sort. They have got better pharmacokinetics and better tolerated. Let's look on that. This is the first myth. Long-acting injectables do not improve adherence. They do not improve adherence. This is a meta-analysis of more all literature talking about discontinuation. And there, as you find, there is no difference between discontinuation of oral antipsychotics and long-acting injectables. So there is no evidence that actually long-acting in, uh, injectables improve compliance. However, we see that people take their long-acting injectables. This is instrument, we call instrumental compliance. You make this compliance, you get the patient, you take this injection. So this is instrumental compliance. Perhaps the second, this is secondary compliance due to the improvement in illness, better tolerability, increased support. People with uh, taking long acting injections have got their CPNs, have got uh, their community mental health team, so you know, they have got better support. Besides, we know lung adherence quickly if the patient don't come to take his injection. So we react more quickly. But there is no evidence that it will improve, Im improve adherence. Do long-acting injectables offer better relapse prevention? This is wishful thinking. This is not correct. Meta-analysis showed that they do not have, there's no significance between oral and long-acting injections in respect to relapse prevention. Okay. Actually, prevents people will relapse anyway. 3.5 patients per cent per year are going to relapse anyway. Are they effective? Yes, they are effective. Long active injections are effective, especially on the secondary outcomes of schizophrenia, okay? rather than the primary outcomes. So they are effective in terms of preventing hospitalization, decreased number of hospitalization, short of hospital stay, and uh, 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 Money-wise, okay, uh, uh, some of the long-acting injections compared to oral has proven to be cost-effective. So, yes, they are effective. Do they improve cognitive functions? Two studies analyzed that, and they found that changing typical to uh, uh, typical oral to long acting improves cognitive functions. And changing a typical to long acting improves cognitive functions. We haven't been able to find that in a study that we published this year. Uh, uh, we haven't been able to find any difference between long acting injectables and orals with respect to cognitive functions. But adherence and poor adherence. So adherence is, is the major pivot point in determining cognitive functions in these patients and not the type in medication. This is according to what we found. There's a lot of study about, there's a lot of talk now about the pruning theory of schizophrenia and the, uh, the improvement of gray matter. 
there are some results, okay, of uh, uh, um, some ongoing, st ongoing studies in the multi now about improvement of myelination on using long acting injectable and increasing BDNF. Uh, these studies are haven't been replicated, so we didn't talk, talk them yet. Two minutes, Prof. Okay. So, people say the pharmacokinetics of, uh, of uh, long acting injection is better. We know that it's better because it's long acting. Okay. At the end of the day, what we need to do to, give, to leave the decision of long acting injection to be a clinical decision based on the patient. What we use depo in certain patients, okay, and we use oral in other patients, okay. We need to have the patient choice as a pivot in this decision. Patient choice is very important. We did an audit on satisfaction of atypical. We found very high, a very high satisfaction of long-acting atypical. So patient choice can be can be the most powerful predictor of compliance. If you engage your patients in dialogue about the use of medication and use long acting injectable is what we are after. We need to improve our therapeutic alliance with our patients. We don't want just to listen to industry. Industry knows that they would like to increase the market size. They know that clinicians, when they prescribe long acting antipsychotic, they don't stop it. So it's a bonus for them. The, uh, uh, those who market antipsychotics still do it. So it's a market that will never end. So we don't listen to industry. We need to know that long-acting injectables remains a tailored decision between you as a psychiatrist and your patient. At the, at the, at the center of this is the patient choice. It doesn't have effect on compliance. However, it improves some of the secondary outcomes. It, it has some effects on relapsing rate. It has better pharmacokinetics. We have changed our attitudes towards more use of this type of, of uh, pharmacotherapy. However, this has to be built on better therapeutic alliance with patients, okay, rather than pushing from industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Absolutely. Thanks. So